So we have a gain, Thomas Stent, and uh, he's going to tell us now what, Thomas? Uh, parameter estimation. Can you speak a bit louder? Parameter Thank estimation. Thank you very much. <laughs> so go ahead. So I mentioned in the first uh, this morning the problem of detection, which is well, you have a, a large amount of data, many months of data, then you're, you're answering the question, does the data contain any uh, signals that you can distinguish from the noise so that you can um, determine that they're present and that they're present at a particular time. Uh, maybe you have some idea of you know, approximate idea of masses if it's a uh, binary signal. Um, but that doesn't answer all the questions about if you have a signal. Um, uh, the, the computing costs of doing of analyzing many months of data is such that you, you do the minimum necessary to be able to detect, but that doesn't, that means there's a lot more um, information that you can extract afterwards. Um, so, parameter estimation, um, you start from this assumption that there is one signal um, at a known time, and then the time has been given to you bef uh, beforehand by the search algorithm. Um, but let's say plus or minus zero point one second. So the search algorithm, algorithm can tell you where the signal is in time to with to pretty good uh, accuracy. Um, so then you have the strain output of the detector as usual um, equals uh, noise term which you don't know. W, uh, what do I usually write? Uh, let's say HDW, TW is the signal. Um, so, what the assumption here is that the output of the detector is, is the noise term, which is we assume is Gaussian well, well behaved uh, noise, uh, plus gravitational wave signal. Um, that we don't know what system the gravitational wave signal comes from, so that's why. How this is different, I mean, it's different in a number of ways from the search algorithm. So, coherent analysis means you analyze all the detectors, uh, all the data from all the detectors at once. Um, Bayesian analysis, well, I'll, I won't go into the mathematical, much of the mathematical description of what this is, but. Um, Essentially, the goal is not to just find the signal, but to have uh, accurate, the most accurate <coughs> and uh, unbiased estimate of, of what its parameters are. So, what do I mean by the parameters? So, this, if we were just describing a gravitational wave signal um, as a function of time in general, um, from a compact binary system, it has lots of parameters. So write these um, after a semicolon and the mass one, mass two, spin one vector, spin two vector, distance to the binary, let's say the luminosity distance, um, theta, phi, oh, psi, there's an angle uh, from, let's say angle from, from one detector on the earth. So the angle from the horizon and also the angle rotating around the, the vertical. Um, so it's this guy direction. Uh, iota um, is the inclination of the binary, so it's the angle if the gravitational wave is traveling along that direction, the binary is rotating around that, 
that, then uh, you also use this inclination angle of the binary axis of rotation relative to the line at which along which uh, we're observing. Um, coalescence time. Okay, we've said that the search is giving us a pretty good estimate of the coalescence time, but we still need to model that um, when, we're, when we're doing the estimate of masses, etc. And coalescence phase <coughs> is uh, how far the binary objects around, are around the orbit at any given point. Um, so, is this another unknown thing? So it's a circular yeah, mass. Like okay, at the moment we're assuming everything is circular simply because well, it's simple and there's uh, evolutionary reasons. If the binary has already been existing and evolving for millions of uh, years, then any eccentricity in the orbit is gradually uh, radiated away by the time it gets to the frequency in which it can be seen by the detectors. But uh, there can be exceptions to that. Also, that the people have not developed a completely general model with including eccentricity. Um, but yes, if you had an eccentric orbit, you would need more parameters. Um, so, what you want, you want to end up with is, um, well, let's call all of these things uh, a big vector of parameters, capital theta. And what you want to end up with is the probability distribution of these parameters of the system you're interested in. So you have a big multi-dimensional parameter space and the probability distribution tells you uh, what values of the parameters are more likely than any other values. Um, then in order to, let's say, make a statement about what the mass is, um, you do a big multi-dimensional integral over all of the parameters that are not the masses, and then you will, you will reduce this to just a two-dimensional distribution of the masses, and then you can uh, make some uh, confidence region, you can uh, draw some region that encloses 60% you know, of the probability or 90% of the probability, or whatever you like. Um, and uh, that's the end product in terms of claiming you've, you've measured the masses. <coughs> so, okay, I think we'll be erasing the detectors. Uh, erase some parts of the detectors. So the basic calculation is, it's, um, well, you're trying to do this multi-dimensional integral over some region of parameter space. So imagine you have a region of parameter space and uh, you have no idea what is the probability distribution, but you can sample the relative probabilities any point you choose, well, you choose a point and then you get the value of the probability at that point. Um, so the, the clever aspect of this is, okay, you have to start off with no idea of how the distribution is, is uh, distribution of probability is over this big parameter space. So uh, the reason this is a difficult problem is, well, you have, if you have an infinite amount of computing power, you could just fill the space very densely points, and that's, that enables you to do, do the integral, but you don't have infinite computing power, so you need to think up clever schemes of placing the points in the parameter space that allow you to do the integral relatively accurately with maybe only a few thousand points. And well, given that you have this 10 or 15, well, 10, 13, 15 dimensional space, depending on if these spin, spin vectors are just one dimensional spins um, aligned with the several dimensional spins uh, pointing in any direction. Um, uh, to, do, to do this integral with only a relatively small number of points over this huge uh, multi-dimensional space is quite not trivial. And uh, I'm not going to just 
like the technical details, basically you have to have a scheme for given the points you've already placed and given the measurements you already have of the probability at each point, you jump from one to the other, you go back, you, know, you have to have a scheme that tells you given the point you are, given what you already know about the probability, where is the next point, uh, what is the best choice for, two, for where to take the next point, such that when you've done maybe a few thousands of them, you're able to do, to do the integral. Um, so you're able to use the samples to uh, basically say, well, let's say, 68% you know, of the probability is within this, this region. So this is the genetic error? No. no. <laughs> this is, uh, well, there's so many ways of doing this. Uh, one of the most well-known well -known ways is the uh, MCMC, one of them, Monte Carlo Monte Carlo Monte Carlo Monte Carlo yes. So, you know, this is a probability, this is a description of, well, Monte Carlo just means it's random, but it's not totally random, because you have to have, you know, you jump, you um, create this by jumping from one point to another, but you have to control the probability with which you jump from one point to the other. And you do that just by well, by looking at the relative um, uh, the relative uh, strengths. Well, let's say at each point you get a value of the probability of the parameters at the point. And well, I think the, the way that, well, one way it works is well, if the probability that you're jumping to is higher, you always jump. If the probability you're jumping to is lower, you you make that jump, but not all the time. So uh, somehow you have some recipe for uh, trying trying the points and including them or not including them. Um, now, how to? Uh, that's only half the story. You have to you have to have a recipe for deciding what points to test in the first place, and that's the, the point where this becomes more of an art. Well, there's no there's no perfect theory of how to do that most efficiently. So there are many different recipes for implementing this. Um, so the other basic algorithm is called nested sampling. Um, again, I, no, I don't, I don't think it's, I can really give a, a technical description of this, um, but. It works in a slightly different way by basically trying to restrict, well, again, if we start with the whole parameter space, um, it's like you would imagine a bathtub, and then you have, let's say, a mountain, an object on the bottom of the bathtub, and you're gradually filling it with water, and imagine the height of the object is the probability of, of the parameters taking a given value. So, Imagine contours of gradually increasing probability density. And then what the nested sampling algorithm do was uh, first you put points all over the space fairly, um, let's see, sparsely, and then you work out, well, this is good enough to determine where like 90% of the probability is, so then you draw your 90% contour, then you put points more density within this within this 90% contour, and that gives you better resolution in the region where there's a high probability, and if you're able to draw this, this successive contour at higher and higher levels of the probability uh, density. And then you know, this naturally ends up you putting more points at the regions which are more interesting because they're more likely to be the correct values. So just to guess, about the right, so you say you can determine only one polarization. And oh. does, it, does it affect this parameter determination or it doesn't matter? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, the physical content, yes, is very, I mean, the fact that the detectors are nearly aligned with each other does you know, quite strongly affect the output of the, of the you know, what parameters can be measured well or what parameters cannot be measured. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so is there a degeneracy? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you could look at the papers and see. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, yeah. I, mean, I can sketch sketch some of these degeneracies on, on the board. 
board. Mm -hmm. but, um, in terms of trying to, <laughs> this is this is the part the part where the blackboard is hardest if you try to um, draw the probability contours mm -hmm. um, as they come out from the actual the actual analysis. Yeah, this is this is the basic idea. Um, so, okay, to calculate the probability at any given point, um, essentially what we do is we calculate the sig what the signal would be at that point. Then you simply subtract the signal from the data and ask yourself, well, how consistent is that with just Gaussian models? Um, so, uh, obviously, if you have uh, parameters which are a long way from the real signal. We'll start off with you know, something with a strong signal in it, which is very consistent with Gaussian noise. We'll subtract the wrong parameters, and then we'll still have some you know, large deviation from zero. Um, so that means you know, it will still be very consistent with Gaussian noise. Only if you manage to subtract out almost the entire signal will you get the residual be uh, consistent with, with just noise. So, I mean, I'm not going to write down the formula for this, but essentially what you're doing all the time is uh, you're evaluating the waveform with a different set of parameters, and then you're subtracting it from the data and seeing if there's anything left over. Um, and in order to do this and get enough samples to, to measure, you know, to get a good idea of the, of the parameter distribution, uh, you need maybe uh, a few times 10 to the 3 independent points, but these sampling schemes are kind of inefficient, so in order to get from one point to another one and then you know, to have the second point to be statistically independent of the one you started from, you need many, many jumps. So maybe it's like you know, order 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 um, actual evaluations of, of the waveform. Um, to get, like, to fully sample uh, the space. And that's all packed into this 0 0.1 second of, of uh, data. So, uh, this, is, this is much more computationally intensive per second of data than doing the search. Um, this can take days or weeks to run just on a single signal which lasts a few tenths of a second. Um, and this is, uh, it depends how, also depends how accurate you want to make the waveform. There are some, well, uh, some of these, if you want to evaluate this um, you know, the signal for a given set of parameters, this can take microseconds or milliseconds, or if it's a complicated model, um, which involves doing uh, integrating the, the evolution of the uh, binary over time, this can take uh, 0.1 seconds or, or one second. So if you have to do that 10 to the 5 or 10 to the side times, um, so no, this, if we are to, if we are going to discover like many more signals uh, over a month, one per week in the future, um, this is going to be the main computing cost um, in getting the science out of, out of the future observations. Okay, so that's well, basically what the, the technical part of this. So, okay, once you have this probability density over the parameter space, you will end up getting, let's say, uh, let's say you're interested in M1, and then you have a probability density of M1, and then you will have some distribution of samples when you've integrated over all the other parameters, and then you say, well, 90% of the samples lie between these two, so uh, that will give you your, your measurements of the bone mass. Well, yeah, so far there's no physics, <laughs> just a question. So, uh, I'm totally ignorant about it, but is it true that all the distributions for all the parameters, one, once you uh, average over the others, have a single peak, or is it possible to have narrow peaks maybe with higher probability? Because in that case, yeah. the MCMC as well as the next assembly could increase with this, right? 
Yeah, so no, if you have a, no, if you have a um, shape of the probability distribution which is uh, the general infinitely complex, you can't do it. So you have some basic assumptions that you don't have a very large number of, of different peaks. Uh, and there's some uh, there's some parameters for which the the confidence regions you now occasionally you have things which are sort of banana shaped or you know, if you, maybe you have one peak here and one peak here and uh, this is it's relatively technically uh, hard to make sure that your sum works correctly in this case uh, but there's lots of tests and many people that I was asking whether it's possible to have a very narrow peak. Yeah, yeah, if you have one distribution and a very narrow peak. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so this is more a question of, well, do you, if it's a very narrow peak and there's a very large boundary space, you know, if you don't even start off putting one sample there, you may miss it completely. Right. Um, is it physically? It's physically, or yeah. maybe not then. Um, well, let's say you know, if, if your mass is uh, okay, if you if the, the signal that you detected in using your search pipeline, assuming that it is a real signal, you, you have some idea at least of where to look in the boundary space. So no, if you allow infinitely large boundary space, obviously you have no chance. But uh, technically, it should always be possible to uh, shrink it enough sufficiently that you have uh, a good chance of, of finding that. And you will also but if this, if the sampling code does not find the peak, it will be obvious because uh, the probability, all these, uh, all these probability values will be uh, basically flat, and the distribution will be completely unlike, un different from what you expect from the signal, and you will be able to tell that something's gone wrong. <laughs> so, uh, the one of the out one other output of, of this the power estimation code is that the distribution of the expected signal to noise ratio. Then you can check that against the signal to noise ratio you've got from the search. So that's, well, that's checking that you are able to find the, all, well, all the probability that you expect. Um, but yeah, sometimes no, sometimes the, the sample just fails to see, see where the signal is. And then you need to well, change its parameters somehow. Just ask you whether we, we, we should expect some of the parameters for multiple peaks. So that's another, yeah, sure. I mean, some, some parameters, particularly angular parameters, or uh, the inclination parameter, for example, the generic people have multiple peaks or uh, strong degeneracy. Um, mass parameters, I think, are usually well determined. And usually, okay, maybe I'll need to start drawing some physical results. I don't know. Yeah, it's certainly possible for there to be multiple peaks. Um, although, yeah, certainly, if you, if you give this, uh, if you're clever enough in, your, in uh, parameterizing the, the you know, choosing your coordinates within the space, then that doesn't happen uh, for very many parameters. So, okay. Start talking about some uh, physical content. So the first thing to think about is this thing called the jerk mass. Um, and it's defined as mass one times mass two three fifths of the mass one plus mass two one fifth. Um, so why are we defining it like that? Well it completely describes what happens in the early part of the uh, evolution where essentially the, uh, the only influence on the uh, orbit is the lowest order uh, emission of gravitational waves. So this is the slow evolution over maybe millions of years up to maybe a few tens of cycles before the merger. Um, so what you can show is if you can neglect higher order effects in the emission of gravitational waves, um, 
then you get an equation like this. So okay, some factors like z and g and i and 2. There, but what you notice is you have the frequencies of some power divided by, um, I think that's, no, yeah, I may have missed out, of, there may be a power missing here, but it's divided by the, the time derivative of the frequency to some power. So no, if you have, at some point the signal looks like that, and at some later point it looks like that, and then you have, oh, I suppose that's a second later, then you're able to measure relatively well the change in frequency um, between one time and another. You have that. Uh, you also know the frequency. Um, so uh, at any point in this evolution, even if you're nowhere near the, the, the merger, uh, the end of the signal, as it were, you can work out this, this chirp mass. Um, so this is like the first observable um, which you get, let's say, out of this low frequency of the signal. Now, uh, if you look at this for the binary neutron star system, uh, this part of the signal is basically almost all of the signal that you can possibly detect. Um, so you get a lot, you, know, you get a lot of cycles of uh, binary neutron star signal, um, and they're almost all in this regime where it's well described just by the lowest order of, of emission of partition waves. What happens if you just know the chirp mass and nothing else? You get a banana. So, okay, we neglect, we pretend that M1 is always greater than M2, just for simplicity, and we get something that looks like that. Um, so, if you're only able to measure the chirp mass, you know that your system lies in this range like that. Um, so that is basically what we will get for systems that are very high mass, um, that merge at very high frequencies, and then you know, when they are being observed, um, they're just slowly evolving in frequency. Now, okay, this isn't particularly useful when we're doing astrophysics because you know, something here would be um, maybe 1, 1.4, 1.4. Something here would be you know, 10 plus 0 0.9, um, the total component masses. So there's totally different astrophysics here relative to here. So uh, this, just the chirp mass itself, is nowhere near good enough to, to get some, uh, good, some, some interesting science out of it. So you need to go, you, know, you need to use more aspects of the waveform. So now, okay, we can look at the later part of the spiral. If we just define mass ratio m two over m one, it's q, and then we have something called the aligned spin component or effective spin and but if we think of dimensionless spins, so uh, we just scale the, the, the angular momentum of each, of each object, so a black hole or a neutron star, um, it has a spin vector and divided by the mass of the object squared, we get, get a dimensionless spin, which you And then um, we have a sort of, we can define a sort of effective aligned spin component, which is well, <coughs> so it's the mass one times spin 1 projected along angular momentum plus mass 2 times spin 2 projected along the angular momentum all divided by the total mass. So it's, it's a sort of average spin component between the two, two uh, black holes or neutron stars. 
So why I'm talking about this, there's some combination of the mass ratio and the effective spin which tells you uh, what is the next order, the, the largest next order correction to this evolution of the frequency. So, in some way, so this chi, any uh, connection begins to an effect? No. no. Well, oh, hang on then. Uh, well, it's formally a spin orbit coupling, coupling, but I don't know if it's comparable specifically to the next period. Okay, this goes back to my. Um, ah, I mean. Um, well, it, no, it could be. Okay. It could be. So, so, any chance to test the uh, lens tube using this um, binary pair? Uh, well, I mean, this is one... Uh, testing GR. Sure. I mean, this is... Yeah, you're testing GR in the presence of uh, space-time, which... You know, this is, this is not, not the uh, structure of space-time, it's the uh, Earth space-time. Yeah. Uh, if one of the, at least one of the bodies is spinning. Um, you would expect this. Sure. I mean, it's, I mean that's, I guess... Yeah, but this, is, this would be a strong field test. This way. And you um, want to do this. So it's, hmm? You want to do this. Uh, it's obligatory, you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in order to this car. Uh, well, I mean, people have spent large chunks of their careers just calculating these corrections to the gravitational wave between the spins. Um, so, uh, if you can show that the evolution of the frequency over time is consistent with um, with these, uh, with being described by uh, this some combination of the mass ratio and the spins, um, then this is a consistency check. This one is calculations in GR, I guess. Um, someone must have been. Uh, someone must have, have been doing this. Yeah. Um, well, doesn't that also go into the spin precession? Yeah, I haven't talked about spin precession. But, but in some sense, the spin precession is sort of the length theory. Yes, right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So. Okay. That's one part of the interaction yeah. of the spin. Yeah. You want to extract these from the data. But but I, I guess what you're it's talking. Possible. It's possible. What you're talking about here, though, is more just the f dot evolution. Is where those two. Yeah. Sure. Go. Okay. Sure. I mean, you know, when. When you get further towards the merger, so when the uh, velocity, okay, you go, you're going towards the merger, so you're going forwards in time, and the velocities of, of the two components are getting larger, separation is getting smaller, so nonlinear effects and uh, 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 also effects which grow as the velocity with the velocity of the components are uh, increasing, so. Essentially, you need to go to higher and order, higher orders of perturbation theory um, to have an accurate description of how this the frequency that changes with time due to gravitational wave emission. And it turns out that there is some combination of the mass ratio and the effective this effective spin that tells you about that. Uh, well, that, that gives you the coefficient um, in the next uh, the next order of the series. So, okay, that's, this is, like, let's say it's the latent spiral, um, and then uh, the velocities of, you know, in the early in spiral portion, the, the velocity is going to be arbitrarily low, maybe up to you know, 0.1 speed of light. Um, the latent spiral portion, you're getting up to some significant fraction of the, of the speed of light, um, uh, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Um, so, okay, if you're able to measure some combination of the mass ratio and the effective spin, that still doesn't give you necessarily very much astrophysics, uh, but it rules out some possibilities. So, <coughs> let's say um, uh, you could have chi is approximately 1 here, or chi is approximately 0 there. So if you're able to measure this like next order term in the frequency evolution, it could tell you that you have maybe a highly spinning system here at high man, uh, highly asymmetric masses, or maybe a system with nearly zero spin here but with nearly equal masses, but it can't really tell you the difference between the, the two in all cases. Um, so is it 
related to the to the inner most circular orbit? Is it because if you have the M equal mass binary and, and low spin, the, 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 I mean if you have the equal since you know the, the, the shift mass and you have an equal mass binary and high spin they merge at lower frequencies. Is this the reason or um, okay well we haven't got to the merging yet. So oh, okay. this is still when you're describing it as a person. So it just happens okay. that you, know, you write down the whole, so you calculate the post turning terms for the loss of A, and it happens that one of them is the sum of some factor in the mass ratio and some factor in the effective state. Um, I, well, it's, uh, I, guess, I guess the answer is no. Yeah. So, yeah, if you, well, if you don't observe the merger, let's say if the merger happens at too high frequency, then you will not necessarily be able to tell the difference. Okay, but then, no. then at the merger, you get a completely different set of effects uh, kicking in. Because, okay, previously you have, if you imagine the two black holes with the event horizon, I can't draw a black hole on, on a blackboard very accurately. Um, no, you can imagine them as nearly quite, quite particles. Uh, but at this point in the evolution, um, essentially, the event horizons are, well, there's one point at which the event horizons just join up with each other and it's uh, it sense of well, Okay, they're not, really, they're not formally event horizons, but you can think of them as uh, similar to event horizons uh, in terms of uh, no information will get out um, to the future. So, at the merger, essentially, uh, you can stop thinking of this as a system of two objects and you start thinking of a system of one object. Um, so this is, you can think of this as uh, one large, uh, high, more massive black hole with some weird perturbation, perturbation applied to it. Um, this will tell you about these last few cycles. So essentially these, these cycles of highest uh, gravitational wave amplitude. Um, and then, you know, once this has happened, what you'll, you'll be in a situation where you have you know, small perturbations to uh, at a stationary black hole at the end. So right at the end of the signal, you're back to a regime where you can describe by perturbation theory. But then the, uh, if you're able to observe right, what's happening right at the end of the cycle, right at the end of the signal, um, you will have measurements that tell you about not the individual masses, but about the, the final mass, which is essentially telling you about the total mass of the system and the, the final spin. So, and, okay. This is also dependent on this effective spin uh, that you started off with. So if you are able to ob observe the merger, um, yeah. these few cycles here, and particularly the frequency at which the merger occurs is basically determined by M1 plus M2, um, then finally uh, you have, let's say, constant M1 plus M2. If you knew, if you can pinpoint the value of what is the total mass, then you can intersect that with this constant chirp mass and you end up uh, knowing not only uh, not only what some functions of the masses are, but you end up being able to determine the masses themselves. And to some extent the spins. So this uh, we're very lucky basically because the signal we have, we see some parts of this late in spiral, we see the merger, maybe we even see this, uh, to some extent, this, this ring down of the, the final uh, single black hole. So what this ends up giving us is, if we knock this out, one 
So let's say this 30, 35, 40, and this 25, 30, 45. Um, and okay, you get a blob. So you have maybe a 68% uh, confidence region and 90% confidence region uh, within this M1, M2 space. Um, and, okay, what I've described here is just, is rather hand waving. We don't, what we do in practice is not separately we try to evaluate what is the constraint from the early in spiral, what is the constraint from the late in spiral, what is the constraint from the, the merger. Um, when we do the, the calculation, this is all inside the waveform model. So the waveform model has to include all of these effects um, all at once. Um, and if that's done accurately, this should give you directly uh, the measurement of the masses. But uh, in order to understand what things you expect to be measured accurately, it's, I think it's useful to have this little picture of different things being measured at different stages of the evolution. So, okay, it turns out that because of where this signal is in relation to the detected sensitivity, um, we were able to see both before the merger and a uh, small amount of the signal after it, and this uh, actually enables you to measure most of, both of the masses quite, quite accurately. Um, and okay, that's uh, that's nice because if all that we had, well, if we had a, a very low mass binding neutron star, then we would have had just this uh, long. Um, long thin banana shaped uh, region in the mass 1, mass 2 plane uh, and we wouldn't necessarily be able to say oh, this is definitely 1.35 uh, binary we would have had a large region of uncertainty with different masses it could possibly be. Um, okay, maybe I should yeah, think about processing spins now. Component of the spin aligned with the orbital momentum that's just has the effect of speeding up the, the in spiral, speeding up the emission gravitational waves, or uh, retarding it. But then spins that are not aligned with the angular momentum have some much have more interesting effect. So I'm not, again, I'm not sure I can do this on the blackboard very well. So the first thing you, you have you note know, is that total angular momentum of the binary, so which is um, spin one plus spin two plus orbital angular momentum, is basically constant throughout the entire evolution. So we can just draw a big vector j and just you know, it just sits there. It doesn't it doesn't change. But then um, the orbital angular momentum. Binary, so at any given moment, the binary's orbit is about there. But then the orbital angular momentum vector can process around the total uh, angular momentum, and then uh, the two component spins, which are generically also no nowhere near in the direction of the orbital angular momentum. Um, these will also process around in a nice, uh, nice sort of dance, uh, which I'm not going to attempt to perform here. But you can imagine them, uh, they're all moving at various rates, uh, processing around such that the total angular momentum is, is constant. So, this, uh, the rate at which this happens is relatively slow, and this again is a higher order effect um, in the uh, general relativity. So, uh, you can imagine the system at 
And one, one moment it's effectively uh, orbiting in one plane, then a few cycles later the plane will shift a little bit, it's effectively emitting a, in a different plane. So uh, the way that this is modeled in, uh, in the waveform models that we're using is just to take, essentially to take, um, uh, take the emission of gravitational waves from a system that doesn't possess and just do a rotation of the coordinates. And then this rotation of the coordinates changes slowly over time. Um, so you know, maybe this, maybe if, you, if I try and draw a picture of what a waveform of this science sort would look like. So that is the standard, like, non-processing binary, and it goes back in time a lot. So that is what you would, what you would get if uh, the orientation of the, the orbital angular momentum stays constant. Um, now, okay, you imagine um, if if the orientation of the angular momentum uh, Let's say it starts out pointed directly towards us, that gives us circularly polarized gravitational waves uh, arriving at the detector. Now, if it's due to, due to this precession, it starts uh, pointing at uh, some non zero angle to uh, the direction of the site, then instead of exactly circularly polarized waves arriving, or like elliptically polarized or linearly polarized, it's actually